All right, Kevin, do you want to go ahead or? No, you go ahead. Maybe I will okay. I'll follow you. Uh, sure. I guess, uh, um, I guess what we're talking about today is uh, revisiting uh, the Indian healthcare uh, goals post uh, COVID. Uh, what do we do if there's another pandemic of this kind? Are we better prepared for the next pandemic and so on? Um, I, I think, you know, let me start by saying if there's one thing that uh, this COVID has done is expose uh, in many ways uh, the vulnerabilities of the Indian healthcare system. Um, of course, one can always argue that uh, uh, we can never be prepared for an extreme circumstance. You're always usually prepared for an average. Uh, you're never really prepared for the extremes. Uh, but in many ways, I think, uh, uh, you know, this pandemic has exposed uh, the need to massively strengthen uh, the public uh, healthcare infrastructure um, in, in our country. Uh, you know, this is not intended to be a criticism of any governments in the past, but I think what we need to do is to uh, take this as a message that uh, uh, that we need to get our act together. I think there is a goal in our uh, uh, planning commission to spend uh, 3% of our uh, GDP on healthcare. We are currently at about 1.5%. Uh, that itself should add, uh, you know, many tens of billions of dollars uh, in healthcare expenditure should we get to that percentage. So I will stop here. But, you know, I think that's my view that, uh, you know, we really, really need to invest in uh, in the public healthcare system. Thank you very much. I think uh, the healthcare is definitely up on the floor now, up on the table rather, because of the pandemic. And uh, I would like to look at it from both short term as well as from the long term point of view. Uh, if you look at what uh, Narendra Modi's government has done over a period of time over in the healthcare segment, it's quite amazing. Uh, they started with very basic, the hygienic factors. What they call it is a swatch part. Is, is to get, you know, better toilet facilities, to have free drinking water, a roof on the head. And these hygienic factors are very important for uh, for uh, the preventing a lot of diseases. I think this was this was one thought. And I think the entire process of looking at healthcare has been well planned out and, and well strategized uh, by this government, which has never been done in the past. We used to do something, uh, you know, we'll announce a scheme, put money on the scheme and then move ahead and then drop the scheme and then put some money on some other scheme and drop the scheme. But this government is thinking very holistically the entire healthcare uh, and how we need to approach it. So I talked about this first. Uh, then they knew very well that you need to have connectivity and therefore the internet became a very, very critical part. And then to make direct payments uh, uh, and direct connect, you are the Jandhan put into place. Having done that basic Jandhan, Swas Bharat, Aadhaar card, then the government came with one of its biggest announcements for the universal health coverage. And that is the Ayushman Bharat. I think one of these biggest healthcare program ever announced by any government in India. And this Ayushman Bharat has two pieces really. The piece number one is the health and wellness centers basically to ensure uh, the availability of primary care, to ensure free essential medicines, the diagnostic facilities. The second part is very, very critical, is how to look at the hospitalization of, of the uh, below the pyramid people and how to cover them for hospitalization. And this scheme covers almost about up to rupees five like hospitalization. Almost now they're going to cover about a hundred million people on that. I think this this is one of the biggest team of the government that has been announced. And now to brief all that, they are doing what I call it national digital health mission. It's a fantastic thought process is to capture the idea of the whole uh, healthcare uh, uh, stakeholders in one platform. So you have payers, you have delivery guys, you have other stakeholders, and put them under one platform. That is the role of the national uh, health division. Having done that, you know, in a short run, they have also tried to push the uh, the healthcare 
through the Delhi ecosystem. But I think I will stop here and say there are three things that the government is looking forward is how to achieve the UN SDG goals of 3.8. Basically, universal health coverage, financial risk protection, and affordable quality health care. And government is exactly moving in this direction. And the questions are then going to be how this delivery is going to happen. So I'm going to stop here for the time being. Maybe others can continue. Um, hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, my apologies. That seems uh, the video uh, link uh, doesn't work. So I guess you can hear from me. So um, yeah, very happy to be on this panel. Uh, I'm based in New York and we run a um, healthcare uh, investment company, uh, both uh, the, I would say the uh, hospital medical centers, but also, you know, invest in digital health. And I would say uh, this uh, COVID uh, crisis happened last year, uh, really accelerated the uh, transformation from the traditional healthcare toward the, the digital healthcare. A lot of the uh, treatment uh, in the past, um, you know, in fact, uh, I think it was driven by a lot of the physicians who actually prefer to see the patients digitally, remotely, and uh, and also accelerated uh, the a lot of the uh, testing equipment to make them uh, wearables and make them portables. And lastly, I would say for the even for the regulation and for the healthcare providers, uh, in the past, it were there were a lot of hurdles uh, for those. I would say um, distance uh, based or long distance based uh, treatment and um, uh, uh, seeing patients. But since COVID, I think all those hurdles have been lifted. And uh, for example, I saw one statistic showing that uh, the uh, uh, digital health-based um, uh, treatment and appointment went up 40 times in the U.S. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of those, especially you know, some of those, for example. Uh, uh, therapy based a lot of those are uh, actually mainly done uh, online now versus in the past so um, COVID it was a very bad thing but it, it really triggered a lot of uh, positive change uh, to the healthcare to the sector and lastly I would say for a lot of the research uh, biotech research it has been accelerated by COVID so I would say um, you know it's uh, it was a bad event but uh, definitely some uh, good outcomes uh, right now uh, from the uh, you know in the whole healthcare sector uh, both uh, the uh, healthcare providers and also I would say the uh, biotech research sector yeah that's uh, what I like to share <clears throat> Arjun, we can't hear you. Uh, Arjun, just you're muted. You're muted. No. I think you're muted. All right. Yeah, his icon looks. Would you like uh, to? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, you can go ahead. You're saying something. No, no, uh, I, I said it will be nice, really, uh, next year, uh, we'll actually uh, meet in person, I think, mm -hmm. to uh, to have the discussion, to have the panel discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. Arjun, you want to say something? You can go ahead. Uh, sure. I mean, just building upon uh, uh, what the two of you have said, uh, completely agree. I think... Uh, um, 
I, I, you know, in many ways, whether it's on the governmental initiative side or on the uh, pharmaceutical slash diagnostic uh, hospital side, um, COVID has certainly accelerated a lot of innovations. Um, you know, uh, I think <clears throat> I think there are lessons that uh, one can take away from uh, uh, from uh, the events of the last, uh, let's say, eighteen uh, eighteen months. Um, you know, I think I think it'll be interesting to see. Um, I, I think there's a difference between how emerging markets and developed markets will react uh, to teleconsultations and some of these other digital uh, initiatives once the uh, curve flattens for good, um, because we always talk of a third wave and a fourth wave, so one is never sure. Uh, but uh, I, I think there will be, um, you know, distinct uh, differences between how emerging markets behave vis-a-vis -vis, uh, developed markets. Uh, to, to adopt some of these uh, initiatives, just given uh, just given the uh, level of penetration, uh, uh, the whole urban rural divide when it comes to uh, digitization uh, or access to uh, <clears throat> access to digitization and so on and so forth. Uh, I think the need of the hour, according to me, is uh, uh, for Indian for Indian companies slash government to invest in basic research. I think. Uh, you know, I think we are way behind uh, many of our neighbors even when it comes to uh, things like genomic sequencing and so on and so forth, uh, which really, really helps uh, in, uh, in early detection and treatment um, and early detection of the existence of a virus. I think, uh, you know, we have very few facilities that do that um, compared to the West. Uh, so most of the times we are caught with our pants down. Um, I, I really think investment in basic research um, and really upgrading a lot of our PHCs. I think uh, while the governments have announced uh, some very good initiatives and I tend to agree with that, at the end of the day, we need dollars to go into uh, building infrastructure. There's really no other solution. Our infrastructure is outdated. Um, if you drive 100 kilometers away from the urban areas, life is very different. Um, those people don't have access to the basics. And... Uh, um, and I really think, uh, you know, when you, when you think about, uh, I mean, we, we kind of caught up with what happens in Mumbai and Delhi and the lack of oxygen and so on. Yeah, I mean, that's good for the news. But I think the problems are far deeper uh, in rural India and, and you know, 60, 70 percent of Indians still live in non-metros. Uh, and I think there, the need to upgrade the infrastructure is simply uh, the need of the hour. And uh, regardless of deficits, regardless of whatever, I think a lot of dollars need to go in there. Malik, you want to go? I wanted to check if you guys can hear me. Yeah, yeah we, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, yes. Fantastic. Oh. Hi, everyone. I think it's, it's just the four of us in the room, is it? Uh, it looks like. <laughs> We're having a friendly chat. <laughs> it could be like a chat. Yes. Um, fantastic. Well, I just wanted to build on what you said, Arjun. Um, so let me introduce myself first. I, uh, uh, my name is Arjun as well, and I look after Prudential, the insurance companies, businesses at the moment in East and Central Africa. So uh, um, spanning a, a few markets uh, here, uh, and we focus predominantly on life, but but also increasingly on on health. And in two of the markets I manage, we um, uh, have quite a leadership uh, position on the health side and gives us a lot of insight as to, and I agree with quite a lot of what you said, Arjun, in terms of the uh, distinction, first and foremost, between how emerging markets are going to respond versus how uh, developed markets are going to respond is going to be an enormous factor. Uh, uh, Great, so I'm going to turn off my video for half a second while I catch this up. That's the first point. 
The second is in particular because when we recognize not just the Sorry, Arjun. Uh, guys, is that so, uh, 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 you? What Arjun is saying? Uh, uh, no, I can't because it's breaking. It's uh, yeah. Hey, Arjun, Arjun, you're not clear at all. Uh, your connection yeah, is short. Yes, COVID is as much of a uh, uh, is a more. Arjun, we can't hear you. Your connection is that. that is, but I feel it's going to be at a at a at a retail level very very much an economic crisis as it is. Yeah, it looks like we lost him. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's uh, 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 by the way, is this being a uh, broadcast on YouTube or some other platform, or it's just us? <laughs> just curious. No idea. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just yeah, to I'm, keep the conversation mm -hmm. moving, I think mm -hmm. uh, maybe you know uh, where Arjun left two or three points where it's very uh, you know it's well recognized and that for sixty percent of the. Uh, rural population have only 30 percent of the healthcare infrastructure. That's the biggest challenge, and and 37 percent population of the rural do not have any infrastructure within the five kilometers. Yep. Uh, that that is another big challenge that we are facing today. The other big challenge is the underprivileged in urban centers. Their position is equally bad as as the rural guys are, because yep. they don't have access to quality health at all. I think this this has been recognized as a challenge. And what is happening today is as the government seems to be completely aware of these challenges. And pandemic is now a right time to look at it and see what needs to be done. So Amaiz, I will just pose the question to the government. How will you provide access of healthcare to the remotest villages and to the people that need it? So that's that's both uh, issue of of the providing bad India healthcare that is one improve the ability of the masses to avoid afford healthcare and quality healthcare that is that is the second challenge yeah. the government will have to face is how can the affordability improve for the larger population today the affordability is at the top level as well as at the bottom of the level but the middle yeah. people are just left open without any affordability. And the third challenge is the burden of disease. Given that the burden of disease, both in, in cardio uh, and diabetes, uh, how are we going to address this through prevention? I, I think this this may be the uh, you know the three big questions which our government should uh, uh, try to respond now to whatever they are doing in in the healthcare uh, segment. So maybe you know we can find solution to that subsequently. But I'd like to have the views as to what the government needs to do to address uh, the healthcare challenges in India. Um, I don't know if there's any experience uh, uh, from uh, uh, other countries, Kevin. Do you have anything? Perhaps you have an exposure in other emerging markets like Indonesia or Vietnam or Philippines. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, I'm based in New York, and we've been investing uh, in quite some healthcare facilities in the U.S. Actually, investing in more than 200 hospitals right now on about 72 uh, medical centers, and from smaller ones to larger ones. And also, we've been investing some of the um, uh, 
you know, uh, deals in Europe. And in fact, we have been also uh, looking at uh, opportunities to invest in India. And what we have found is, you know, the healthcare sector is very diverse. Mm-hmm. And also quite often, it's really uh, not only driven by the healthcare providers, but also driven by the healthcare insurance. Um, I think different countries really have different regulations, etc. But in the U.S., a lot of those, uh, you know, it's really a very complex system. It's really not very good in the U.S. Uh, you know, the single payer system, like what we saw in Canada, uh, in um, you know, I think Australia, uh, those are, um, I would say, it it is providing a much um, uh, equal, universal uh, healthcare. Uh, but in the U.S., you actually can get top quality healthcare, but also, you know, the it's really it's determined by the uh, which uh, insurance or which insurance system are you in. So what we are seeing is actually insurance companies are deciding, you know, treatment and what uh, level and uh, also the specialties, etc. And also some of the insurance companies are actually building their own hospitals versus also many of the hospital systems are deciding to uh, build their captive uh, insurance system to compete. So the situation in the U.S., I think, it's very dynamic, and uh, and also COVID changes a lot of things. Uh, many of those, I would say, um, you know, the uh, the government actually poured a lot of resource into it. I think probably toward more than a trillion dollar now in uh, here, and um, and some of those innovations I think is going to be uh, uh, used in uh, many other countries, and including India, and uh, in, in particular I would say the digital health part. Uh, yeah. I think earlier speakers mentioned about, uh, you know, the infrastructure issue, right? Infrastructure, I think healthcare infrastructure, it's a big problem for almost every country now. And uh, uh, for, you know, for better or worse, it's not easy to uh, build those massive uh, new medical centers. In fact, uh, what we are seeing is uh, the demand are really more toward what's called um specialty centers nowadays uh, so actually people who are prefer they prefer to go to uh, ambulative uh, center uh, surgical center or the specialty center instead of the massive medical centers the reason is also the you know the the risk of being um, uh, you know the uh, uh, getting covert in fact in those massive uh, medical centers are higher than those uh, specialty centers so we see a migration of um, uh, treatment and investment toward uh, more specialties. And uh, I think this is a trend that's probably going to happen in many other countries. And uh, so COVID really uh, changed a lot. And I think, uh, you know, but it actually might make the whole uh, healthcare system to be more uh, nimble and more decentralized. And uh, it's uh, going to probably also uh, mean, you know, different um, uh, segment and different um, specialties are going to be more developed by themselves instead of being put into those, uh, you know, massive uh, medical centers. I think the trend is toward uh, uh, more uh, specialty. And um, and we're looking forward actually to uh, investing opportunities in India. And by the way, our company is actually Nasdaq Nasdaq listed healthcare acquisition company. So uh, it's a spec company. So the purpose is really to acquire uh, top quality healthcare assets globally. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, thanks for that. Uh, quite familiar, I think. Uh, 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 clearly. I mean, in my view, uh, if one has to just rely on the government to uh, uh, to do everything for us, I, I think that you know is, is a far cry. I think there are many other priorities and firefighting that the government is having to do currently. Uh, you know, I think there has to be a viable system for private sector to participate uh, to help people at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, we talked about insurance. Uh, you know, I think the insurance, so, so there are two things here. I think one is uh, the, le- the penetration of insurance in India is absolutely low, um, even in even in uh, the major metros. Uh, number two, 
Um, you know, so most of these projects have to be what I call public-private uh, partnerships uh, between uh, private players and uh, the government. Uh, the government <clears throat> has the uh, has the reach, has the scale. Um, the private sector has, uh, generally speaking, the skills and the technology. Um, I think uh, there is a strong need uh, to have many, many public-private partnerships uh, to boost uh, healthcare infrastructure in this country. Um, now, I, when, when you talk about public-private partnerships, the challenge always is uh, the government, uh, and any government for that matter, including the current dispensation, has not, uh, they have not recognized their role well enough as a payer. Uh, they're very good at uh, inviting bids, setting up the projects, um, and uh, you know the private sector implements it. Uh, and, and when time comes to uh, pay the private sector for their services, you know you have to run from uh, pillar to post. So, I think uh, once the government recognizes uh, their role as a payer, once uh, you know mechanisms that they have in the Western markets like escrow mechanisms, uh, guaranteed by uh, you know institutions like the World Bank and so on, are put in place, um, I think you can one can begin to see a sea change in uh, in, in how these services are delivered. Uh, my company, for example, uh, we ran one of the biggest public-private partnerships in the country in diagnostics in, uh, in, in a particular state. We still continue to run uh, in another state uh, in the Northeast. Um, and uh, I can tell you that uh, people at or below the poverty line, which is a very significant part of our population, uh, the only way to reach them and give them uh, what I would call, uh, you know, high standard diagnostic services and other services is only through a public private partnership model. Um, but again, like I said, you know, I think the need of the hour is for the government to recognize this um, and to put in place mechanisms to ensure that uh, the collaboration between the state governments and the central governments. And I think it's a very similar situation in the US. I mean, at, at some point in time in the COVID <clears throat> we really did not know who was in charge. Was it the state government or was it the central government? You know, even in the U.S., they had the same situation. Um, states like Texas and Michigan were doing their own thing. Um, so, I think there needs to be some very clear ground rules uh, that are put in place to uh, to help this whole mechanism move forward. So, Arjun, I just want to take it from there. You know, uh, there is. In in case of the Avishman Bharat, a strong partnership whereby the fulfillment, the delivery is done by the private partners, the private hospital. Now, as this Avishman Bhavan goes much higher to the level and extends itself to middle population, there would be a need for a private insurance partnership there. They need to have a tiering of co-payment. And when there is a co-payment, there needs to be an insurance player also there. And I think this is the, one of the biggest needs that is being felt me, that the middle class population, if you want to cover, on the same platform as the Avishman Bhavan, then let's have a tearing of the co-payment scheme. And once that is done, it will make a lot of difference for the healthcare in this India. Because A, the insurance level, which is now around about 50%, will go up to 70 to 80%. That's very clearly it will happen. B, the infrastructure development pace will increase, be it hospitals, uh, be the number of beds, be the work, uh, healthcare workers or nurses, which is required. And this will give the impetus for increasing the pace. So I see a great opportunity of a partnership between the private players and public sector in this segment. The other segment is very, very critical on, on the execution part, the delivery which the government is doing, particularly the sub-centers, uh, the community healthcare centers, the public health centers. Now, these are not being managed well. And we see major problems of oh, vacancies not being filled up, uh, infrastructure not being available, basic facilities of toilets not being there, uh, and so on and so forth. It is here the partnership will play a very important role. Government need to identify the big hospitals. And these big hospitals should be given charge if like hub and spoke model, where they should be able to run these primary health care centers. There are almost about 45,000 primary health care centers. There are 40,000 health and wellness centers 
and combined with 100 and thousands of uh, healthcare centers are available for private parties to run. It's a great opportunity and a great employment, uh, and plus it really enhances the quality of the healthcare that is provided uh, at, at at the ground level. I think these are two areas which I think where the partnership will work, where the private players will come in, and in a big way is in is in the process of digital and disease management and and in the process of looking at uh, looking at how to give access to the larger population that's where the private players will come in with gadgets with equipment a uh, point of place digits uh, carrying of the e e tele uh, tele uh, tele uh, medicines all that will be part of the private players and therefore the government has to dr draw an ecosystem and clear guidelines as to what is going to be the ecosystem for telemedicine once that is defined whole lot of things will change dramatically so i would i would put these three areas are so critical as we move forward and the faster the government moves we'll see the healthcare accelerate at a very fast pace thank you sir yeah this is very exciting i think to hear you know all those development uh i mean india you know i it's a, such a country i admire so much it's um, you know in fact i think for a lot of the what has happened i think uh, you know has exposed a lot of the i would say the uh, lack of uh, prevention and lack of you know a lot of what's called uh, uh, pre acute a lot of uh, those could be actually uh, helped by you know by essentially uh, promoting more um, public health w awareness promoting you know the um, a lot of those um, uh, prevention mechanism and a lot of those actually i think uh, uh, people are looking for uh, you know india i think uh, a lot of the if um, if you can actually have more um, prevention based or uh, uh, you know, health living style, uh, that will make uh, the situation much, much better. And uh, I think I look forward to, you know, more uh, of those, to learn more of those uh, from India. Yeah. In, in, yeah, in the past, I think people have been really focused on too much of how to, uh, you know, cure disease, but quite often it's already too late. <laughs> and, yeah, no. uh, and yeah, yeah, and uh, a lot of I think what's uh, you know coming out of India is really how to prevent those happening, mm -hmm. yeah. health living, so, and all those very important. Yeah, from so sickness to healthcare prevention is is what yeah, India yeah. needs to look at. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. If there was one word during COVID that uh, uh, appeared in the press most often, it was the word comorbidities. Right. I think uh, uh, whether it was diabetes, obesity, hypertension. Um, yeah, I mean, after the US, India is the diabetic capital uh, of the world. Uh, in fact, uh, I can tell you that in our company, we have a program where uh, our goal is to uh, reverse diabetes uh, the healthy way. Um, so I'm sure, Kevin, you've heard of uh, uh, Livongo and Berta in the US, uh, which are doing sure. something very cool. Um, so we have to started that. Uh, Again, it's entirely through a digital platform, IoT devices, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think that is the future. Uh, you know, we have, in fact, when we did a survey, we found that 95% uh, uh, of the people we surveyed did not know that uh, they were borderline diabetic. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and we covered thousands of people. Um, and so ignorance is kind of bliss, right? So I think it starts with... It starts with proper diagnosis. It starts with reversing uh, what are actually, I won't even call them diseases. I think they're more lifestyle disorders. Uh, you yeah. know, in a bad lifestyle, you've ended up with diabetes. Um, and I think all these most reversed uh, can actually reduce the burden uh, on the public and private healthcare infrastructure. Uh, you know, I think your hospital stays can get short of, uh, it can reduce the burden on insurance companies. Uh, I just think there are the tip of the iceberg. There's just so much more to do. Yeah, Arjun, totally agree with you. Um, yeah, Livango, Teladoc. In fact, Teladoc is a company uh, based in New York, not far from where we are at. <laughs> so we know them pretty well. They develop, I would say, really uh, rapidly um, uh, after COVID outbreak because I think, yeah. you know, it's, it's really... Um, 
I would say it's happening at the right time. People immediately need uh, all those uh, treatment when the physicians are afraid of uh, seeing patients. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but it's not only uh, 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 Teladoc or Livango, both of them have, they have merged with each other, but also there are probably more than 20 um, digital health platform, uh, platforms now in the uh, US. Uh, they are yeah. actually trying to tackle across board uh, from, you know, from uh, not only, I, I would say, from digital health, uh, but also from uh, to manage the whole uh, process, make it much more efficient. Yeah. And uh, uh, but you and also you're completely right that uh, quite often it's really you know we we talk to the um, the, the the hospital uh, you know administrators and physicians all the time, and uh, the key word uh, what you said is uh, this uh, comorbidity. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this um, the issue of um, in fact uh, you know COVID really triggered a lot of pre-existing uh, conditions, mm -hmm. right? And how to actually uh, make people to be healthier, you know, increase the natural immunity is so much yeah. more important than yeah. uh, what what happens after that. And yeah. uh, so you know to increase uh, the uh, immunity. Uh, it's really about you know health, ha healthy living, about yeah. uh, you know those uh, you know some of those device wearables that can help uh, people to uh, manage their lifestyle lifestyle better. Like you said, you know you, uh, a bad lifestyle end up with some uh, you know uh, a manageable disease, but uh, it, it doesn't have to be like this. And I think COVID really waked up a lot of people. Uh, from you know, uh, from a lot of the, I, I guess people now learn that maybe you know it's, uh, you know, to live a healthier life would be a much better choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that COVID has really pushed, uh, uh, which I will add, I think we're running out of time possibly, is uh, uh, the evolution of uh, AI in, uh, especially in uh, on the on the imaging side. You know, I think uh, as people went in for uh, chest X-rays and chest CT scans. Um, what we found, and you know, we developed something in house as well, is uh, using artificial intelligence to uh, predict early on the severity of uh, uh, of the COVID uh, on the uh, on the chest of the patient. Right. I think there were scores that were available uh, using the AI engine. Um, I think there's a huge potential for that uh, worldwide. Uh, you know, just to use uh, AI tools and really AI tools is something that you can take uh, to the uh, underdeveloped as well as the poorer regions because all that you have to do is set up the infrastructure there and actually the reading and the diagnosis is done by the AI engine somewhere else uh, yeah. and, and, and information is given real time. So I think there's a huge potential. And by the way, Kevin, I think uh, I just saw your profile. You teach at NYU. I went to NYU as a, for my MBA. So. Yes, I just realized too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very, very happy to meet an uh, alumni. Thank and uh, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure you know that uh, New York University's medical school is really at the yeah. forefront of this uh, COVID um, yeah. fight. They, they were involved with a uh, uh, vaccine. And, uh, and also NYU Medical School is the first in the whole country in the U.S. to offer free uh, tuition for the whole medical school, all the students. Yeah, no, I it was such a it was such a breakthrough because you know medical school. I mean, when you make it so expensive, it's really kind of prohibitive for a lot of people to go to. It's not good for the society. And yeah. now with this, I think it's better. I mean, to you know, they they actually created a second medical school at of NYU to specifically mm -hmm. focus on the public health, community health side. So yeah. for this part, I think that's what we need. In fact. Uh, have more, I would say, community-based uh, healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. Just want to add what you said. You know, the the really the awareness is very critical, and awareness should start from schools because the mm -hmm. kids are the real change makers. And there was a study done in Bihar and Jharkhand, where said when the awareness was done, uh, it was increased by ten percent. The hospitalization rate came down by six percent. Mm -hmm. It's so solid and data is there today and it changes the behavior, you know, over a long period of time. And that's that's very critical. And today we have enough of diagnostic tools to bring about awareness, uh, to treat uh, uh, disease management, 
to treat the diseases itself and also for diagnosis i think this is the role where the corporate the pharmaceutical companies and 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 the uh, diagnostic uh, need to come together to work together and the entire issue of uh, of prevention uh, will will get a really flip the government is also looking at mido which is which is uh, the platform they will have and also the mido uh, backpacks where you can actually take and down uh, the equipment to uh, the last person in the village uh, test it give a feedback back and then uh, you know uh, tell the patient what's to be done so i think this is a, a, a great effort done by the government moving forward and i i i think there are a whole lot of areas where government is focusing it they need to speed it up the first important thing arjun you mentioned is when are they going to spend 2 and a half percentage of gdp that's the <laughs> if the needle doesn't move from 1% all this is important for long so they need to move it up from 1.2 or 1.3 to 2% immediately if they really want to speed yeah. up the healthcare yeah. and if they do so you will see the healthcare facilities uh, will change dramatically but you know the health is a concurrent project i just want to pack a last point here and the problem is also with states the most of the state government hospitals are abyss most of the deliveries done by the states are very poor there is yeah. hardly any budget allocation by the states on the healthcare and unless the healthcare is improved by the state the budgets they improve on the healthcare nothing is going to change at the ground level yeah. so i think that's an important thing that we need to focus on how to move the states to spend money and to improve delivery yeah what happens in uh, in our country in healthcare at least is uh, you know it's the reverse right it's it's god proposes and man disposes so <laughs> so the central government says something and then we are at the mercy of the state government and the people that there so you know um that's kind of the tra- tragedy of the situation uh, but anyway uh, i want to i guess time do we just keep yes. going or uh, <laughs> uh, i think um, our time is up it's 4:30 right yeah yeah All right. Okay. Uh, so, so Kevin, it's been a pleasure uh, uh, e meeting you. Uh, likewise, uh, Kevin. I think Kevin, we did meet once very briefly uh, when uh, I think you met me with Rajiv Shukla, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, oh, Rajiv Shukla. Okay. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah I remember so, you now. Fine. Uh, uh, anyway, so uh, nice meeting you again. Yeah. Uh, and, pleasure. Uh, pleasure. And good luck. Look forward to staying in touch. Yeah, great okay. uh, to meet you Thank guys. You. And let me know if you come and by New York City. I'm happy sure. to host a dinner event for you and uh, to catch up. Sure. Thank Kevin, I've sent you my email. Would be love to catch up for your interest in India and see how sure. can I help you. Sure, sure. sure. Thanks. Thank I've you. been uh, yeah. looking at a lot of opportunities. Okay, take care. Yeah. Okay. Then there is a message that we can go on as long as we want. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll also go to the other uh um, panels to 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 okay yeah okay bye okay bye bye bye